I wish you all a very blessed Eve of the Nativity of our Lord and Savior as we prepare for our vigil tonight. I'm going to tell you a little bit today about uh, something I'm reading. Shocking, I know. I'm always telling you about what I'm reading. I've been reading um, and and just finished yesterday uh, one of the Christmas tales of Charles Dickens, but there's a lot of background to that, so we'll get to it. I want you to know it's coming, though, that I've been reading this, this book, much less familiar than A Christmas Carol, called The Cricket on the Hearth. But before I get to that, on Friday we had the service of the Royal Hours, and afterwards I read two homilies by St. John of Kronstadt. Uh, short, uh, very straight-to-the-point homilies, but important homilies, very beautiful ones that remind us of what the purpose of the Nativity is and how we ought to properly prepare for and celebrate the Nativity. In the second one that I read, he very much convicts the people for having their minds wholly occupied not on Christ, but on the wrong thing. And what were their minds wholly occupied on? Food. Food. Something that I think that we can relate to. He points out that the foods that the people are so excited to break the fast with are foods that they can have throughout much of the entire year. But this particular feast of the Nativity, we only have now. He tells the people to focus not on the sweetness and sumptuous nature of the foods that they'll break the fast with, but rather upon the richness and sweetness of the feast itself. Just before that feast of the Nativity, we get a taste of this richness with today's Gospel lesson. It's a Gospel lesson that I know causes a lot of confusion for people. But I want to tell you the patristic commentaries on this particular lesson are so rich and so beautiful that when you read them, they become like a feast before the feast. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed going through so many of these commentaries this last week and delving into the mystery of why this genealogy was placed there by Matthew and why he wrote it the way that he did. We miss out on this this great beauty when we don't utilize these patristic commentaries and we end up missing the beauty that's hidden within the words. It reminds me a lot of those pictures you see of people going to museums and standing before this great work of art, but instead of looking at the work of art themselves, they're looking at their phone, trying to learn about it that way. To not read such commentaries when we have them so available to us, to not utilize these great gifts of the patristic commentaries... It's much like going to some great natural beauty like the Grand Canyon, and when you get there, turning your back to the Grand Canyon and standing there without actually looking. These things are right here in front of us. And so I won't do it today, but I'm going to I'm going to offer you today a little bit of a threat. And the threat is this. One of these years, one of these years, I may actually talk about how deep and rich this genealogy text is. And I'm going to go on for a good hour and a half, maybe two hours. I'm not going to do it today, but I'm telling you, the commentaries are that full. They are that rich. There is so much patristic insight hidden within these seemingly monotonous verses. Not a single letter, not a single letter of the scriptures is wasted. And I could go on and on and on with what I learned this year and I've I've learned over the years with it. I won't do it this year, but one of these years it's coming. Because we have the vigil tonight, that saved you. (laughs) But I was ready. I was ready to give like a good hour and a half long homily and tell you just how amazing this genealogy. I promise you, you will look forward to it every year when you realize the depth of the riches contained within. But again, don't worry, it's not today. Ken doesn't have enough space and storage on his camera to record the homily that I want to give. Maybe next year. For this year, I want to mention one thing about this genealogy. Genealogies in the ancient world were written much like this, but this has uh, quite a few differences. And one of the things that Matthew does that's so strange 
is he breaks what is a cultural custom of that era. When you wrote genealogies, which were not a, a purely Jewish thing, many would write genealogies, you would always focus solely on the line of men. You would not mention women in the genealogy. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew mentions not one, not two, but three women. That in itself is a rather shocking thing. But it's made even more shocking if you know the names and the lives of these names that are contained therein. Because rather than naming the righteous women of the Old Testament, he picks out three women who were marked by their unrighteous lives. These are the ones he decides to place into the commentary and in the genealogy. He mentions Tamar, who was known in Genesis 38 for her sin of incest with her father-in-law. He mentions Rahab, who is a harlot from Jericho. And then he mentions Ruth, who herself made an attempt, a failed attempt, but made an attempt to enter into premarital relations. He picks three women who are marked by their unrighteous deeds. And each of these unrighteous deeds is somehow related to the nature of intimacy, and therefore they're especially shameful. Why would Matthew place these in there? Clearly, clearly, with no explanation given in the text for why he does it, clearly this was a divinely inspired and divinely guided decision on his part. This, by the way, is the the brilliance of scriptures. As a little aside, so much of the scriptures are filled with these great mysteries that force you into deeper contemplation and prayer and study. And the scriptures do this for us. If we really study them closely, we end up having a lot of questions, and that causes us to study them even further. And if we apply what we learn in those studies, we become purified and holy because of those studies. So this is part of the brilliance contained therein. But we go back to this question, why? Why did Matthew place these three women there? There are quite a few reasons given from the fathers of the church, but St. John Chrysostom gives what I think is the most direct and most important reason. Again, he, he lists multiple reasons why, but he specifically says this. He says that the reason Matthew places these three women who are known for shameful acts and deeds in this genealogy is to show that Christ came not in spite of our weakness, not being ashamed of our vices and running away from them. Rather, he runs towards our shame. He runs towards our weaknesses, and he embraces them and makes them part of his very own lineage. Instead of disdaining us and forcing us to run to him, he comes to us in our broken, shameful state. Our weaknesses and shameful vices then become the door he uses to do what? To prove his mercy and his loving kindness. It's our weaknesses that actually beckon Christ to us when we call upon him. He sees us in this state and he pities us. He doesn't shame us from afar and turn his back to us. Rather, our weaknesses beckon him to come closer if we call on him to heal us. So, going back to this book that I finished yesterday, The Cricket and the Hearth. I've got this book. It's over 500 pages of Christmas stories from Charles Dickens. I've read A Christmas Carol many times. And every year I want to read this book. And every year I find that I just don't have the time. And so this year I decided, rather than trying to read the entire thing, I'm just going to read the one story that I probably started maybe for five or six years in a row, and I've never gotten past about ten pages, and I'm just going to read it. I'm going to force myself, I'm going to read just just that one, even if I don't finish the entire collection. And so this book, again, it's called The Cricket on the Hearth. I'll tell you my little review of it. 
When it came out, I read that the reviews were very mixed. Some found it just absolutely wonderful. In fact, it was so well liked by many that stage productions of this far outnumbered stage productions of A Christmas Carol at the time. But there are those who weren't so fond of it and thought that especially the third chapter, the final chapter, was overly sentimental. You can guess based on my German heritage which side I fell on. It was overly sentimental. It was pretty gushy at the end. It was a little bit too much. But it was still really enjoyable to read, mainly because Dickens is so good. He's so good at giving you just a couple lines of description and maybe one line of dialogue from a character and immediately, boom, you understand that character. You know that character well. And you kind of fall in love with these characters. He's so good at it. And this book became especially worth it, I thought, because of one character in it. The daughter of one of the main characters, her name was Bertha. And Bertha, (laughs) kids like that name. (laughs) Bertha is a very unique character in Dickens' literature because she's blind. And at the time, society really looked down on people who had any physical maladies like this. Someone who was blind was seen as also unintelligent and other things. And he writes Bertha in a way where she seems to be this glorious person who you want to be around so badly. She's so positive, so energetic, absolutely loves every person around her. Bertha, in her blindness happens to see things in a much more beautiful way than they actually are. Part of the reason for that is her father, in order to care for her, wanted to make sure that she didn't see life in a dour and dark way because of her blindness. And so despite the fact that she and her father lived in a rather poor house, they had kind of ratty clothing, they didn't have a lot of sustenance, he would lie to her in his descriptions of how they lived. He would tell her, in fact, that they lived in a grand home, that his clothing was, in fact, some of the best that you would see upon the street, that people would admire it. And his boss, who was a miserly and uncaring fellow, much like Ebenezer Scrooge, he would tell her that, in fact, he was hiding his great virtue, And that whenever he sounded like he was being cruel or rude, he was in fact just joking because he was of such a kind demeanor. And so Bertha spends much of the novel laughing at the fact that he's putting on this air of uncaring, unfeeling nature and talking about what a wonderful life she has and how blessed she is. It comes about in the final chapter, with many other things happening, that it's revealed to Bertha what her father had been doing. And those around her reveal to her after she asks that indeed she lives in the poorest house of the neighborhood. It's a rundown shack that in fact her father owns no glorious clothing. And in fact, some of the people who she she thought to be so kind were actually very selfish and cruel. And Bertha at this point begins to weep. And in her weeping, her father begins to lament and tell her that it would would have been better had she never been born to him because he'd ruined her life. And she reveals in her weeping that she wept not because she was so sad, but rather she was rejoicing that she had been given such a father who would create this beautiful world for her when she could not see. In the end, she's the one who believes that she benefits more than those who have eyes because she's allowed to live in this glorious fantasy and it made her such an optimistic and such a positive person and it brought her such joy. It's a really beautiful scene in, again, a book that wasn't my favorite from Dickens, but it made it so worthwhile. I'll probably go back and read it again. And I thought it was a perfect Christian analogy to what we're talking about today with these women mentioned in this gospel lesson. To take a malady, to take an injury, to take some sort of shameful inability on someone's part and to turn it into benefit. This is exactly what Christ does in the incarnation. This is what he does with this genealogy. 
he not just comes to our weakness, but rather becomes the offspring of generations of shameful weakness and sin. He takes it upon himself, as St. Paul says, he becomes sin for our sake. Christ, the God-man, in whom all power reigns, becomes weak in order to raise up fallen mankind. And we, in turn, seek to embrace weakness, but proper weakness, through exhaustive ascetic labors, so that Christ will come to us. This is the gospel, that as we become weak in the proper way, Christ becomes our strength. It's almost as if Christ, throughout the Gospels, you'll notice, is attracted like a magnet to those who are most to be pitied. And what that means for us is that we can attract the grace of God by numbering ourselves among this group and recognizing that we too are to be pitied in our sins. Indeed, we are to be pitied. Humility truly sees this. But Christ reveals himself to those who are in weakness, and we, like this great character in Diggins' novel, we rejoice because we see things as they really are. So may we have the the spiritual sight of this glorious character, Bertha. May we recognize our weakness this season, and may we glorify Christ, who himself became weak for our sake, to raise us up from the mire of our sin into the glory in which he dwells. May the Lord strengthen us. Amen.